And we're very happy to have uh, Sumit Das talking about target space entanglement holography. Over to you, Sumit. Thank you, and good afternoon. You can hear me right? Okay, good. So I'm going to talk about some work I've been involved with for the past couple of years or so. Uh, a lot of this work was done with uh, Anura Kaushal, Gautam Mandal, Sandeep Trivedi, Song Liu, Sean Hampton, and some very recent work, which is not out yet, but we hope to put out very soon with Antal Jeviki and Jenji Young. What's happening? Oh, okay. good. The familiar kind of entanglement in quantum field theories is what I'll call entanglement in base space. So this is the notion of an entanglement of the degrees of freedom, which are localized in some region of space, which is denoted by A here, on which the theory is defined. This can be described more correctly, I guess, in terms of a subalgebra of operators. These are the operators which can be used to perform measurements in this subregion A. And as we know well, in holographic theories, this is evaluated by the Ruth Akayanaki formula and its generalization. And as we also know that in usual relativistic field theory, this entanglement is famously infinite because of short range correlations across the boundary of the region. This talk will deal with a different notion of entanglement. It's a notion of entanglement in the target space of a field theory. Now in examples of holography, part or whole of the base space of the bulk theory emerges out of the target space of the holographic dual. For example, in usual string theory or M theory examples, the bulk lives in space times which are of the form ADS cross Y. Y is some internal space. The internal space here arises out of the target space of the field theory, which lives on the boundary of the ADS. For example, in ADS five cross S five, the N equal to four young Mills theory has six scalars and it is the six scalars which form the embedding coordinates of the S5. There are of course instances where all the space directions are emergent. For example, in D0 brain holography, non-critical strings, SYK models, and many others. Now in holography, there is a deep connection between entanglement of the states of the dual theory and the smoothness of what we call the bulk. This connection is usually explored when the entanglement is the usual base space entanglement. It is natural to suspect, however, since from the point of view of the bulk, there is very little difference between the ADS space and the internal space, that there should be a similar connection between target space entanglement and the smoothness of the internal space. In particular, for the cases where the entire bulk arises of the internal degrees of freedom, any entanglement will be entanglement in the target space. It therefore follows that entanglement in the target space in these theories have an interpretation as an ent entanglement in the bulk. Now it is generally believed that bulk entanglement should be finite as opposed to entanglement in usual relativistic field theories. And it's also believed that the scale which makes this finite is believed to be Newton constant. That is the coupling of the theory. As we will argue that for simple situations when the target space entanglement is calculable, we will trace the origin of this finiteness. And in this case, we will in fact show that the finiteness is a non-perturbative property from the point of view of the field theory or whatever the theory is in the bulk, completely invisible in perturbation theory. So I'll start discussing a, a sort of prehistoric examples of emergent space of holography 
And that's the duality of two dimensional non critical strings and gauged quantum mechanics of a single n by n matrix M. So this is the action, this is the covariant derivative with a gauge field AT. Of course, in one dimension, zero plus one dimension, a gauge field doesn't do much, but it does impose a Gauss law constraint. In, for example, in the AT equal to zero gauge. This means all the states are singlet. We can fix the gauge further by using unitary transformations to make this matrix to be completely diagonal. The eigenvalues lambda i then become coordinates of fermions. It becomes fermions because of the van der Mond Jacobian, which comes from the change of variables. And the, and the remaining y symmetry, which is for muting these eigenvalues. And in this, that's why it becomes fermions. And in the double scaling limit, only a quadratic term in the potential survives, and one as a Hamiltonian, which is a this is a many body Hamiltonian of n fermions in an inverted harmonic oscillator potential. Of course, any n body quantum mechanics can be written as a non relativistic field theory by second quantization. So it's useful to rewrite the theory in terms of a second quantized fermion field, which I call psi. And the Hamiltonian of this becomes that. Of course, the field has to satisfy the condition that the total number of fermions is n. And the way I've imposed this condition is by, in, by going to a grand canonical ensemble with, with a Lagrange multiplier. The parameter gs here is the inverse of a scaled Fermi level. So, if it is a harmonic oscillator potential, you measure the Fermi level from the top multiplied by n, and we are going to the double scaling limit corresponds to n going to infinity, mu going to zero, n times mu held fixed. So the space of eigenvalues becomes the emergent space coordinate in this fermion field theory. This is a conventional field theory, although it's non relativistic. Therefore, there is a notion of entanglement of a subregion in X space with the rest. A calculation of this quantity is something which I did many years ago. The motivation was again to understand a possible meaning of entanglement in string theory and to understand what makes it finite. This calculation has been more recently revisited by Sean Hartnell and Mazenk using techniques which have been developed in condensed matter physics with a much more accurate calculation, and I'll quote their answer. The answer is the following. If I take a region between Q1 and Q2, Q is basically the X coordinate, which is related to the X coordinate by this local transformation. And if I take this region far away from the turning point, then the entanglement entropy looks it depends on Q1 and Q2 as a log with a denominator, which is the effective coupling. And I'll explain to you why this is the effective coupling. The answer is clearly completely finite. Now, from the UV finiteness of this entanglement entropy in the fermionic theory is easily understood. What else can it be? you have a system of n fermions living on a line. It's a little bit tricky why it persists to be finite in the n going to infinity limit as well. And this happens because the scale that is making it finite is in fact the Fermi level. The most direct way to see this connection to string theory is to in fact reformulate this in, in the theory of the eigenvalue density or the collective field. So the Hamiltonian, this is a kind of a non-relativistic bosonization of that fermion theory. And the Hamiltonian for the bosonic field can be derived. And this is what the Hamiltonian looks like. This is like a string field theory in the bulk. The fluctuations around the large end saddle point 
of of the of this Hamiltonian gives rise to an action whose quadratic piece is exactly a massless relativistic scalar and an interaction which is position dependent. And now you can see why this quantity which appeared in the answer for the entanglement entropy are called a string coupling because this is precisely the quantity that appears in front of this cubic couplings. This massless scalar field up to a fuzziness at the string scale is in fact what is called the massless tachyon of the two dimensional string theory. This scalar is the only dynamical field in this theory. Nevertheless, it turns out as famously pointed out by Polchinski and Natsume, that even though this is the only dynamical field, the scattering of these fields in fact encode the effect of a gravitational field. Now, this is a theory in one plus one dimension. So there are no gravitational waves, but there are Coulomb forces of, of gravity, which in this case, in fact, are not to be massive. And what Polchinski and Natsume showed that if you look at the S matrix of this theory carefully, you understand that there is an effect of exchange effect of this Coulomb gravitational field. The scale of this entanglement entropy, as I pointed out, is the coupling of the dual string theory, which indicates that this finiteness will not be visible in string perturbation theory. To understand again, what makes it finite, it's useful to perform a calculation of this leading contribution for free fermions in a large box with no external potential. So this is not two dimensional string theory, but nevertheless, in, it is a fermionic theory. It is finite. We would like to understand how does this happen in the bosonic language. In this case, there is an exact result for what I've called the leading uh, contribution to the entanglement entropy, which can be written out. It's nothing very um, insightful about it, but some limits are insightful. In this result, Kf is a Fermi momentum. When the interval is small in units of Kf, what you get is an entropy which is extensive in the size of the interval. When the interval is large in units of Kf, what you get is a result which is logarithmic in the interval. And this result looks very similar to a relativistic Dirac fermion except that the role of the UV cutoff, which appears in a Dirac fermion theory, is replaced by the Fermi momentum. So clearly, the result is finite because the Fermi C has a finite depth. This, in fact, is the key point. For Dirac fermions, there is a Dirac C, which is infinite, and that leads to the usual ultraviolet divergent answer. We would like to understand this from the bosonic point of view. In this case, that collective theory looks like this. And if we treat the scalar theory perturbatively, we would of course get to leading order, a logarithmically divergent result, which is characteristic of a massless scalar in one plus one dimension. The fact that the UV scale is a string coupling or Newton constant, is what one might expect in a, in a theory of gravity as pointed out by Susskind and Muglum many years ago. Since collective field theory is the string field theory of 2D non-critical strings, we want to understand how does this bulk entanglement entropy in fact become finite. <laughs> now in the theory of free fermions, the entanglement entropy of an interval turns out can be expressed in terms of the cumulants of the number of fermions in this region. So this is the more, most general expression. And in leading L, the leading result is in fact the particle number fluctuation. In fact, this is the way condensed matter physicists say that we can measure entanglement in, in these theories of many body fermions. However, this op operator A, which is the number operator of fermions, is in fact the collective field itself. 
So therefore, this integral is nothing but the equal time connected two point correlator of the collective field. And we can therefore go ahead and evaluate this in the collective field using the collective field Hamiltonian. So in this case, in fact, the case which we are dealing with, because the, it is calculable, when there is no external potential, it turns out that the eigenstates and the eigenvalues are known exactly. And the reason why they're known exactly is to go back to the matrix model where it comes from. Since there is no external potential, the Hamiltonian of the matrix model is just this. And if I write it in terms of the unitary matrix, which is like that, which is equivalent to putting the eigenvalue space in a box of size L, this just becomes the Laplacian on UN. And it is known very well that the eigenfunctions of this Laplacian are shoot polynomials, some symmetric polynomials of this object, which is trace u to the n. So using this exact eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, we calculated this connected correlator. The answer in the energy momentum space in the large L limit is given by this, this formula, whatever that formula is. But the, we can check that we in fact reproduce the exact agreement with the known fermion answer. Likewise, therefore, this leads to the correct expression for the entanglement entropy obtained for fermions. You can notice that in this Green's function, the poles gives you the dispersion relation of a particle whole pair in the fermion theory. This is the non-relativistic dispersion relation. This answer, of course, has a perturbation expansion in the ratio, the momentum divided by the Fermi momentum. In fact, the perturbation expansion can be summed. You can recalculate this object using Feynman diagrams. And you know, these are some of the lowest order Feynman diagrams. And you can sum this series. And you, of course, exactly get the same answer. This is a summation which has appeared in some other context in the condensed matter literature, in particular this paper. The interesting thing that any truncation of this perturbation series will lead to a divergent result for the entanglement entropy. A finite answer is visible only when the series is summed. It is therefore tempting to speculate that if there is a well-defined concept of an entanglement entropy in string theory, even in higher dimensions, the result should be finite. However, the finiteness is a non-perturbative effect. And once again, the scale which makes this quantity finite is the Newton constant. However, now we have to address the question, what does it mean to talk about a region in a theory of gravity? In a gravitational theory, a priori doesn't make, this doesn't make quite sense because of diffeomorphism invariance. Nevertheless, if there is a holographic dual in terms of a non-gravitational theory, we may try to give a precise notion of this quantity. So we will therefore need a notion of target space entanglement in theories with multiple matrices. And that's what I'll turn to. An interesting example of a dual theory of multiple matrices is in fact the BFSS model of the D or the D0 brain quantum mechanics. Here we have nine matrices and their fermionic partners. And we cannot, of course, you choose a gauge where all the matrices are diagonal. We need to understand, therefore, how to talk about entanglement entirely in terms of the matrix degrees of freedom instead of eigenvalues of a matrix as we have been doing. To understand this, let us go back to the one matrix problem and ask, what is the meaning of entanglement in terms of the matrices? A naive guess would be that this would be an entanglement between, for example, the matrix elements which lie in a block of the n by n matrix with the rest. But this, of course, is not gauge invariant. 
because you can use gauge transformations to take this matrix elements outside the block. This could, however, be a description in some given gauge. However, we would like to understand this in a completely gauge invariant fashion. So let's go back to the problem of target, of, of target space entanglement in quantum mechanics of n fermions on a line. We want to formulate the problem not in terms of fermion field theory, which is quite, which is the conventional expression in terms of base entanglement, but in terms entirely of the operators which denote the locations of fermions on its line and its momentum conjugate. These are what I'll call lambdas and the pi's. A typical many body operator is of this particular form. There's always a sum of i from one to n and arbitrary products of powers of lambdas and powers of pi. For example, you can have a quantity in a physical quantity in this many body theory, which you can write like this. What it does, it measures the nth power of the position of each particle and sums over all particles. Now, suppose we can make measurements only if a particle is in some region A of the real line. This, of course, restricts us to the set of operators which perform this measurement and which forms a subalgebra. The subalgebra can be defined by defining a projection operator, which I've written out like this. And the effect of this projection operator, as you can see, is to pick out only those eigenvalues which lie in this particular region A. We can then construct a new operator, starting from what operator we started out with, by inserting this projection operators between the original operators of the theory. For example, if I have an operator which only involves the positions and not the momentum, the projection operator commutes through all of those and you just have a, a simple expression in terms of these delta functions. In second quantized language, this is precisely this operator. And these are the kind of operators which we would measure, which are the form the subalgebra of operators in the second quantized fermion theory. Consider now the expectation value of an operator in a pure state. And just to understand what this gives rise to, let's consider the simple case of two particles of an operator which is sum of lambda cubes. For a general wave function, psi of lambda 1 and lambda 2, which is of course anti-symmetric because these are fermions, you can easily see that this expectation value becomes a sum of two terms. The first term involves an integral over just the region A and this sum lambda 1 cube plus lambda 2 cube. The second term involves an integral over A and an integral over the complement of A. And there's only one term, which is just lambda cube. So what this operator does clearly, it measures the cube of the position of the particle only when it is in the region of interest A. And this construction, of course, generalizes. What does this mean? This means that the Hilbert space is not a product Hilbert space, but it's a sum of products. It becomes a sum over sectors. The sectors are labeled by the number of particles which lie in this region of interest. If you are familiar with the way people discuss entanglement in gauge theories, you will notice that there is a big similarity with this kind of construction. In that case, the sectors are defined by charged sectors of them, <coughs> which appear in the Gauss law. Acting on a state in a given sector, this operator has non-trivial action on only those particles. Therefore, we can think of this in terms of an operator which lives in a smaller Hilbert space 
which pertains only to the region of interest. The entire answer can therefore be written in terms of reduced density matrices, a density matrix for each sector of the theory and then summing over sectors. Here is an explicit expression for the density matrix. Note that the way I have written it here, this, this rho k tilde is the density matrix. That density matrix is not normalized. Indeed, in fact, the trace of that density matrix gives you the probability to obtain k particles to lie in the region A. What this means is the full reduced density matrix in the direct sum of these sectors is indeed normalized, it's block diagonal, and the reason why that is normalized is because the sum of probabilities is equal to one. Given this density matrix, you can therefore define a von Neumann entropy, which I'll call the target space entanglement entropy, which is trail rho log rho, written in terms of sector, you have this expression. In the ground state, the wave function is an anti-symmetrized product of single particle wave functions. And then each of them are spread over a one dimensional line. So this particular wave function is pretty delocalized for the free particles. These are like plane waves. And we are making measurements using detectors which are placed only in the region A. This von Neumann entropy can also be expressed in terms of normalized density matrices for a sector. In this following, in this following way, this splits up into two parts. The first part is just what we is usually called a classical piece. The second term is a sum of entropies of each sector, which is weighted by the probability to find the part K particles in that in the region A. In fact, I would like to emphasize this notion exists even for a single particle. In this case, the answer is completely classical. It's a sum of these probabilities. Therefore, this is not an entanglement between the particles. If I have a single particle, it doesn't have in any, doesn't have anything to entangle with. This is what we call a target space entanglement. It is this notion which agrees with the usual notion of base space entanglement in a second quantized formulation of the theory. And this is something which we showed explicitly. Some general properties are discussed in these papers. And I like to say that even though we use free particles which move in an external potential as an example, the concept of course is independent of that. It works for interacting particles. And this quantity is therefore of interest in various many body problems. Very often in many body problems, one knows wave functions in the first quantized formulation but one doesn't know how to construct these states in a second quantized formulation. And our construction can then be used to understand entanglement in this system. And it has in fact been used recently. We know that n fermions on a line is secretly gauged quantum mechanics of a single matrix in a particular gauge where the matrix is diagonal. But our aim was to obtain an, a result which is completely gauge invariant. So this is what we are going to do now. Now the set of gauge invariant operators in terms of this staying with the single matrix formula are again products of the matrix and its canonical conjugate with some ordering. Define a projector, a matrix valued operator, which is given pretty much like the kind of projector I use in terms of these eigenvalues, which is like this. That the gauge invariant operators, which belong to a subalgebra, are obtained as usual by inserting the projector between these matrices. It is trivial to check, of course, in this case, that in the gauge when this matrix is diagonal, this thing just becomes the projector we have been using in the n-fermion problem. However, 
this projector, the way we have obtained this subalgebra is completely gauge invariant. We have first done the projection and then performed the trace. And the answer is, of course, completely gauge invariant. Because it's gauge invariant, this note, this construction can be carried over to multiple matrices. For example, in the theory of the zero brains. To understand this, so once again, we are for concreteness, we are thinking of a theory of nine matrices Xi, we'll not consider the fermions at all. Let's consider some function of these nine matrices, which is itself a Hermitian matrix operator. And we are going to introduce a projector, which, for example, takes this integral x going to zero, x greater than zero, which we will see projects on two measurements in the space on which the eigenvalues of this f of x, this operator, are positive. This is can be very clearly verified in a gauge where f x is diagonal. For example, if I choose this to be x1 minus a, okay. the above projector clearly introduces the target space constraint that the eigenvalues are x of this x1 are greater than a. However, but now we have the freedom to introduce other interesting projectors. For example, we can restrict the eigenvalues of this kind of radial operator to lie bigger than some number or not. The construction of the projected operators follows exactly like what I had shown for the single matrix case. You just keep inserting these projectors, obtain the projected axis, and finally take the trace. But it is useful to see what does it mean in terms of a picture. So let me take this function to be just x1 minus a. So, and in the gauge where x1 is diagonal, so th let's skip this slide. <clears throat> we know that the projector picks out the eigenvalues of x1, which are greater than a. The question is, what does this projection do to the other matrices? For example, in a sector which is labeled by k, that means k of the eigenvalues lie in that region of interest, it is easy to see that the projector in matrix space picks out the block, the k by k block. In, let me rather skip these two slides and go over to a bulk meaning of this. So where I lost my slides. Okay. For the case of a single matrix, the target space entanglement entropy had a bulk meaning. This is simply the base space entanglement and the fermion field theory or the collective field theory. And up to effects of the order of string length, this gives a notion of bulk entanglement in the field theory of a massless tachyon. We want to explore if there is a similar meaning for DP brain theory, starting with D0 brains. For D0 brains, the classical ground state has commuting matrices, which can be chosen to be diagonal by a gate choice. The eigenvalues of these matrices are then identified with locations of these brains in the D dimensions, where D is the number of matrices. Staying in the classical level, these off-diagonal matrix elements are then open strings which join the brains. This is the original picture of Witten of how open strings joining brains describe young mill series. The entanglement associated with the target space constraint then naturally becomes identified with the region of the bulk, which is associated with the constraint of replacing the same function as a function of the bulk coordinates. For example, consider a snapshot of a configuration of the eigenvalues lambda and the matrix elements x. So we consider two three by three matrices, x1 and x2. And we want to look at this in a gauge where x1 is diagonal. 
And X2, of course, is on, has all kinds of off diagonality. These matrices in this picture are represented by a configuration which looks like this. There are like three, because it's a three by three matrices, there are three D0 brains which, are, which look like this. And these open strings we join these brains are represented by these off diagonal matrices. If I now use a constraint of x1 greater than zero, what does this mean? It means that two of these D brains, D0 brains, lie in the region where x1 is greater than zero because the other one had an x1 which was less than zero. So this projection keeps these open strings. It turns out there is another projection which you can define, which also provides a different subalgebra, which also keeps the open strings which join these D brains with the ones which is outside the region. In a similar way, for a constraint which is of a radial nature, what this projection does is to retain, for example, these open strings which lie entirely in this region. In a quantum theory, of course, this naive picture does not generally hold a strong coupling. However, we can use this picture for states where the dominant configurations are brains which are far separated. The states may or may not be among the low energy states, which are also described by the supergravity rule. And this is in fact tricky for D0 brains. However, as some recent work has shown, there are some quantities for this picture seems to hold. One example is the effective action of brains, which are separated from, the bunch, from a bunch of others. For these higher dimensional brains, where there is a Coulomb branch, which corresponds to multi-center solutions in the, in the bulk, this situation is a little bit better. So even though there is no accurate, no concrete connection to a bulk space as defined by supergravity modes, there is a connection to the bulk space as the space in which the D0 brain moves and the target space entanglement, which we define, in fact defines a bulk entanglement. In an interesting work, <coughs> these authors have used a Born-Oppenheimer approximation to analyze aspects of this target space entanglement. They consider some well-separated D0 brains for which these configurations are very well understood. And use in this approximation, they find they can calculate, they can do an approximate calculation of this target space entanglement. And they find, in fact, the answer is proportional to K square, where K is the number of D0 brains which lie in, this, in, in the region of interest. I must point out, there is another notion of entanglement in an internal space, which is defined as follows. Consider, for example, a case where the internal space is S2. This can come about if there are three scalar fields in the gauge theory Xi. The gauge invariant operators on in this theory are characterized by, therefore, by SO3 quantum numbers L and M. These are, in fact, spherical harmonics. And in terms of the scalar fields, they are represented by symmetric traceless products of this Xi. One can now define a set of operators which are labeled by two angles on a sphere, which are linear combinations of these operators folded on by spherical harmonics. And then one can restrict these thetas and phi's to lie in a certain region of the sphere. These operators, you take these operators, take products of this and sums of this and form a subalgebra, which would therefore pertain to a region of the S2. 
I'd like to point out that this notion is in fact quite different from the notion which I just talked about. The notion I just talked about is intimately tied to the physics of zero brains, whereas this notion is a lot more natural if you want to talk about a notion which relates to supergravity modes. There is a related notion which is called entwinement, where you have a system of n identical particles and you consider what is called a k body density matrix, which evaluates only k body operators. The target space entanglement, I mean, there has been a, a some amount of work which relates this notion to some non minimal surfaces in the bulk. The target space entanglement we find is different from this. There is yet another notion, which is called matrix entanglement, which is again different. And I mention all these notions because there could be many different notions of, of you know, target space entanglement. Given all this, you got to ask, how do we calculate this? I think the best bet for an accurate calculation of this thing are in fact numerical calculations. Over the past decade, in fact, there has been rather impressive progress in numerical Monte Carlo calculations for D0 brain quantum mechanics. And these calculations have provided precision tests of the ADS CFT context. Motivated by this, we have obtained in fact expressions for the target space ready entropies in terms of path integrals, which can be used to perform numerical calculations. I will not go through these constructions, they are rather complicated, but I just wanted to flash a slide uh, to see what these paths would sort of look like. They are complicated, they look, you know, they don't look very easy, but they are very concrete. So you can put them on a computer. We are in fact currently exploring how they can be used in these numerical calculations. Without doing a calculation, let me speculate about what the answer could be. We will take, we will take some inspiration from the well-studied case of two-dimensional non-critical string theory, which I started out with. In this case, the UV scale, which makes the entanglement entropy finite, is the coupling and not just the string length. In the context of higher dimensional holography, in fact, it is therefore natural to think that the scale which gives makes this entanglement entropy, this whatever this notion of bulk entanglement entropy is, the scale that makes it finite is in fact the Newton constant. That of course is the coupling. The Newton constant, of course, is one upon n square. The target space entanglement involves entangling n square degree of freedom. It is therefore natural to expect that the answer scales as n square. This motivated us to guess that the leading answer, in fact, would saturate the Bekenstein bound. This is just a guess. But then we notice this conjecture has been made earlier from many different points of view. But the point is, in all these earlier discussions, it was not clear what is precisely the entropy people were talking about. In our case, the definition of this entropy is very precise. And this can, in fact, be disproved by numerical calculations, which we discussed about. Right now, I will not bet a lot of money on this conjecture, but it's a natural conjecture to me. Let me now turn to some applications of these notions of target space and entanglement which various people have done recently. One application is to the case of half BPS states of n equal to four young Mills theories. It is well known that these states can be described by a complex matrix model. In fact, the holomorphic sector of a complex matrix model. 
In this case, the complex matrix is one of the three complex scalar fields which are dimensionally reduced on S3 because of the BPS condition. This Hamiltonian is supplemented by a gauge constraint which requires all the states to be invariant under a residual U N symmetry and holomorphic and the wave functions are holomorphic up to an overall factor. The arc ideas of target space entanglement can be used to define a notion of entanglement of a region on this complex plane. The problem, in fact, is the same as the problem of lowest Landau level problem in integer quantum Hall effect. So in collaboration with Sean Hampton and Sinong Liu, we did this calculation. In this case, the calculation can be done in terms, again, in terms of a second quantized fermion theory. And we obtain new analytic expressions for entanglement entropy for the integer quantum health problem. A similar calculation was done by Suchi and Yamashiro for a class of, we did the calculation for the ground state. They did the calculation also for some excited states of which correspond in the holographic constant to giant gravitons with some answers which look to be consistent with the conjecture that the a, it, it follows an area law. A more non-trivial problem has been solved by Frenkel and Hartnell. And there is an interesting two matrix problem and this like a genuine two matrix problem, unlike this, the holomorphic sector of the complex <coughs> the complex matrix problem, which arises in the low energy description again of fractional quantum Hall effects. The, the thing is that in this problem, the ground state in fact can be calculated. And in the ideas of this target space entanglement using these projections to define a subalgebra of multiple matrices has been used in this problem in a non-trivial way, leading to some interesting results. My time is almost up. So let me finish with an epilogue. An understanding of target space entanglement and its relationship to approximate notions of bulk entanglement is at the heart of understanding bulk locality. We have discussed some notions of such entanglement and speculated at, about its possible connection to the notion of bulk entanglement. In the cases in which we examine, this quantity is finite so long as the coupling of the bulk theory is finite. The scale is provided by effectively by a Newton constant. In fact, in our discussion, we have ignored an important fact about finite N matrices. And this fact is that finite N single trace operators with more than N powers of the matrix are not independent because of trace relationships. We have worked implicitly in the end going to infinity limit with the coupling held fixed. However, one might expect that at finite end, this thing which is called the stringy exclusion principle also plays a role. I don't know at the moment what role does it play, but this point demands further investigation. From the point of view of the Valk theory, we argued that this finiteness is a non perturbative phenomenon, invisible to any finite order in perturbation theory. And it will be interesting to see how these results, in fact, relate to many recent discussions of finiteness, which are based on characterization of the von Neumann algebras. <laughs> <laughs>